Hey friends, it is Pastor Dustin, and we are back for our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for joining me. If you would, grab your Bible and maybe a pen and a journal if you have one, and uh, let's get ready to dive into the book of Hosea. So hopefully you were here last week uh, at church or watching online for the Hosea sermon. If you haven't listened to the Hosea sermon, I'm not sure this Bible study is always going to make a bunch of sense to you. So uh, if you need to listen to that Hosea sermon, you can click down on the show notes below and listen to the sermon on Hosea, and it should be really helpful. And then come back and watch this Bible study. Um, also, in the show notes below, you will see the Bible Projects video on the book of Hosea. Um, I love the things that the Bible Project produces especially their biblical summaries of each of the books. And if you want to see their summary of the book of Hosea, I would really encourage you to see it. It has way better graphics and animation than my Bible studies do. Uh, but um, all these things should be really helpful to you. So uh, if you want to dive into the book of Hosea this week, all of the resources are there. The sermon, the Bible project, and of course, I would love for you to be joining us every morning in our daily devotional as a church. We call it the Ephraim Co-op. And uh, Ephraim is going to be all over the book of Hosea, and uh, we're going to make a fun play on those words. Uh, but before we dive into Hosea, hopefully you've got your Bible, you can open up to Hosea, and then we will be going into uh, the book just real fast, just a couple of uh, announcements so you know. This upcoming Sunday at church, which is going to be the 12th of September uh, 2021, uh, we are going to be taking communion Normally at our church, we take communion on the first Sunday of every month, but because of Labor Day weekend and we, used, we were going to have a retreat plan, but we had to cancel it, uh, we ended up moving communion to this upcoming weekend. So uh, I would love for you to be preparing your heart and your mind to take the sacrament of communion with us on Sunday. Uh, we're going to be reciting the Apostles' Creed. We're going to be singing a wonderful song based on the Apostles' Creed, and then we're going to be partaking of communion together. Uh, so look forward to that. Also, this is an exciting week for me. I am leaving tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. with uh, one of my best friends, Pastor Zach Washburn, over at Calvin Presbyterian Church up in Corvallis, one of our sister churches. And I'm going to be with three other pastors uh, in our denomination, the EPC. And the five of us uh, are going and we're meeting in Denver for three days for our annual accountability group. And uh, I've known these guys, some of them, for 16 years uh, maybe even longer than that. But several years ago, we started a um, sort of tradition that every year when our denomination meets, all of the pastors and a bunch of um, lay elders meet once a year at something called General Assembly. And uh, several years ago, uh, me and these pastors decided that that's when we were going to use um, our travel time as accountability. And so several years ago, we spent three days at Yosemite National Park, and it was amazing and a great time of fellowship and accountability. And, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we went to Denver. And this year, uh, even though we weren't able to meet at our annual meeting in person, we decided to use our frequent flyer miles that have been stored up. And we are flying to Denver for uh, three days. So I'll be preaching on Sunday, uh, but I will be gone starting tomorrow morning, Wednesday through Saturday. So you can tell I am recording this on Tuesday. Um, so anyway, all that to say, please be praying for me that this is an enriching uh, time. Uh, it's important time for me to see my friends and fellow pastors. And also, you know, it's been a, it's been a tough couple of years and I haven't seen some of these guys in you know, about two or three years. So uh, it's pretty cool. So all that to say, um, that's what's going on with me this week. I hope you're having a great week and I hope the Lord is meeting you every morning during your daily time with him. And let's dive in to the book of Hosea. Uh, sorry, so if you go to Hosea chapter 1, uh, the first thing I want to point out is Hosea is a prophet living around the late 700s. So think 750 to 700 BC. And, uh, you know, remember BC, the dates kind of work in the opposite. So 750 would be further away, 700 would be closer to the time of Jesus. And this was a really um, a hard time for the nation of Israel. The kingdom of Israel had split into the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom that people called Judah. Uh, but what you'll notice in Hosea is he's one of the few prophets in the Bible uh, that has a book written after him. And he's one of the few prophets that actually is called to the northern kingdom. And when you read the Bible, what we find is that the northern kingdom 
um, has many more um, wicked kings than the nation of Judah. And the nation of Israel um, lasts only until 722 BC, and they're exiled by the Assyrians. And so when we talk about the exile in the Old Testament, we have to remember that really the northern kingdom uh, was exiled in 722 BC because they didn't heed the warnings from people like Hosea. But then the, the big exile that we hear a lot about in books like um, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, um, that exile is actually the Babylonian exile. And that's where we get the stories of Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah. So really there is the exile, but really there were multiple exiles and, and two major ones, right? The Assyrians when they took out the 10 northern kingdoms or northern tribes and then the southern kingdom with Judah and Benjamin later on. So you don't have to be able to repeat that story. You just have to understand uh, tonight that Hosea is called to this northern kingdom, which is worse than the southern kingdom in the sense that they don't last as long and they are seemingly more wicked. And so Hosea is unique in that he's reaching this group of people. And of course, um, as we talked about in the sermon, Hosea has this um, sort of unique life calling to marry a wife who is going to be promiscuous and apparently have kids uh, who are not his, right? So we know that his first son seems to be Hosea's first son. His Jezreel is his name, which means God sows. And then, of course, um, those next two children, we're not really sure that they're Hosea's. You know, um, the book is a little sensitive about it. It doesn't come out right and say these were not his kids, but it doesn't actually say she bore him these children. And then when we read chapter three, it becomes clear that she's gone off to other men and he's got to redeem her and bring her back. And as we talked about in the Sunday, like what's the whole point of this sort of sign act that Hosea is supposed to marry a woman who will be unfaithful to him and have other kids from some other lovers, but then he's also supposed to come and forgive her and love her and redeem her and bring her back into his family. Well, what's that all supposed to point towards? Well, God makes it very clear in chapters one and two that that is supposed to be a symbol, a sign of how God's people have, have sort of strayed away from him and gone after other lovers and been unfaithful, but God is always going to redeem his people and bring them back because we have a God who is not just just, but also loving and forgiving, right? And so the story of Hosea forgiving and redeeming his wife is really meant to be a story of God redeeming sinful people like you and me. And so um, it's a powerful story. Um, it will be told through the ages because it's a story of redemption and it's a story of God's heart. And it's also a story of God's judgment and his um, um, hatred of sin, right? I mean, we, we know God is love, but to love anything means you hate other things, right? So when you love your kids, you hate it when they are abused, right? Uh, when you love your wife, you forsake all others, right? There, there is this sense, of course, that when we love people, we also hate when something bad happens to them. And that's not inconsistent. That's actually deeply consistent. And so God hates when his people stray in their hearts away and they pursue other things. And of course, he wants to woo them back. Uh, Hosea uses the word allure. He's going to allure his people back. It's a beautiful image. All right, so all that to say, what are we going to look at tonight? Well, if we can, go to Hosea chapter 1 and notice in chapter 6 that um, Hosea has a child and she is named No Mercy. And then later on, he has a child. Um, this is verse 9. And the Lord said, called his son, this next child, the third child, not my people. And of course, there's that sign act, right? So Lo Ruhamah, that's the name in Hebrew. No mercy and not my people. So that everybody would be like, well, why does Hosea have these kids with these strange names? And it's because God is saying to his people, you're not my people. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to show you any mercy. Well, that should get their attention because they should want God's mercy, right? Who doesn't? And, of course, if you go into chapter 1, it ends with this incredibly hopeful picture, though, that one day God will show them mercy and he will make them his people. And they will appoint over them their one head, their one leader, and they shall go up from the land, right? And God will sow blessing on them. So that's how chapter one ends, right? It's the meta story, right? God's people are wayward, like Gomer was wayward to Hosea, but God is going to redeem them. And even though they weren't really his people and they weren't receiving mercy, they will receive mercy. And it's all centered around this one leader, the one head, right? Do you see that in verse 11? Well, and then if you get into chapter two, he 
basically uses the same analogy about how God's people were wayward in their heart. But then that's where we get these beautiful verses in chapter 14 and 15 that God is going to allure the bride, right? Allure his people back, redeem them. And I love this um, verse right here. It's always stuck out to me. He says in verse 15 that the valley of Achor will be a door of hope. This is Hosea chapter 2, verse 15. Do you see it? And this is all sort of poetic language for God is going to redeem Israel. And the Valley of Achor was a um, cursed section of town. If you go all the way back to the book of Joshua, I think it's in Joshua 4, 5, or 6. It must be uh, Joshua 6. And after they've defeated Jericho, um, this guy named um, Achan, you know, he steals some of the gold. And, uh, you know, this is where, you know, his family was put to death. And so it's this cursed, dark place. But God says, one day I'm going to redeem that cursed place and make it a door of hope. And uh, I started off by talking about the Bible Project guys and those great videos. And those videos come out of a, a, a church in Portland, actually, if you can believe it, called Door of Hope. And this is exactly where they got the name of their church. They love this image that God is going to allure people back who have gone away from God in their hearts. He's going to bring them back and he's going to make even the dark places beautiful. Even the Valley of Acor, that cursed section of town, is going to be a door of hope. Uh, what a great name for a church plant uh, in a city like Portland, right? Don't you love that? And of course, that's all symbolic of, well, who is going to be this sort of Messiah, this head, this um, descendant of David that's going to gather God's people who didn't have mercy, that weren't God's people, and bring them so that they would have mercy. And those people who were called not his people could be called his people. Well, um, when we read the New Testament, of course, we get the answer that who is that person? Well, of course, it's nobody else other than King Jesus. He is the one head, the one shepherd, right? This is uh, Ezekiel 34, who is going to be the shepherd. My servant David shall be shepherd, right? It's this joint project between God and his anointed, the Messiah. This is Isaiah 53. Uh, this is Jeremiah 23. Who is this person that's going to come be the head, the leader of God's people when he regathers them and shows them mercy, um, right? So Hosea is definitely tapping into this theology that a Messiah is coming who's going to redeem the people. And of course, the New Testament knows all of these verses in and out, and they have them memorized. And so if you flip over to something like 1 Peter, which if you're in our, you're reading the um, Ephraim Co-op with us every day, you'll be in 1 Peter. Uh, you may remember uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, if I can flip there in my Bible, I think it's 1 Peter. If you go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, let's see. Uh, this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to how Peter has these verses in mind. Um, he says to the church, those who love Jesus, who would be both ethnically Jewish but also ethnically Gentile, to anyone who bows the knee to King Jesus, he tells these people, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right, he's he's pulling from um, you know all kind of wonderful Old Testament passages, right? Exodus and Isaiah and so on. And then verse ten: Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Right. So um, how does Peter see Hosea being fulfilled? Well, who is the the descendant? Well, it's Jesus, and Jesus is offering whether you are a Jew or Gentile access into being God's people and to receiving his mercy. Uh, whether you are Jewish or Gentile, it's for anyone who bows the name of, or bows to the name of Jesus. And this is exactly where Paul goes with this same passage in the New Testament. When you go to Romans chapter 9, so if you flip over to Romans, and uh, I'm just using my ESV study Bible here. It's a great resource. Um, I would love for everybody to have one if they don't. If you need one, email me. I probably have an extra one I can, I can mail you. Uh, but in Romans chapter 9, uh, Paul's talking about election and calling people um, to himself. And, uh, you know, it, the sentence is a little complicated, but I think you can see where he's going. In verse 23, he says, uh, this is Romans 9, verse 23, In order to make known the riches of his glory... 
for me, for vessels of mercy, right? Now mercy, there's a, he's thinking about Hosea, right? In order to make known the riches of his glory to vessels of mercy like you and me, which he has prepared before him for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Right, so when Paul's looking at the church, you know, the ecclesia, the gathering of people who love Jesus and confess him as Lord, he says, you know, um, he quotes, he says, this is the fulfillment of Hosea. And there's more fulfillment just in the sense that, like, we want Jesus to return and fully bring the kingdom. Uh, but the down payment, the kingdom is already here, but not yet, right? And so we still await the day that King Jesus returns and redeems all of creation so that physically places like Acor uh, are redeemed to the fullest extent. But we know that this is being and has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus, but we await even more. All right, so um, like I said, it's kind of some deep theology, but hopefully that's helping you see how the New Testament writers are reading Hosea, right? They're, they're looking at Hosea chapter 1, and they're thinking, hmm, God is going to take people who are not his people and make him his people. He's going to show mercy. He's going to send us the descendant of David. He's going to redeem us. Yeah, that's all centered around the work of Jesus. Okay, so if you go back to Hosea, you flip back over there, right? Chapter 3 is that sort of summary about, you know, God tells um, Hosea to go redeem his wife. And if you're trying to find Jesus in Hosea, look at verse 3, verse 5. It says God's going to, like, give them a time where they're away from him. But afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. And the New Testament is clear. We are in the latter days. Ever since Christ came, we've been living in those latter days. And now, whether you are Jew or Gentile, we look to Jesus, who is our king. And, of course, you know, um, when you get into chapter 4 through 14, if we keep going in Hosea, we'll know that this is sort of where um, the story of Hosea is sort of left behind, um, or at least it's not talked about. And now it's more about how Hosea and his wayward wife becomes that real analogy between Israel and his wayward people. And uh, what really uh, affected me uh, reading this is when we read chapter 4, if you read it this week, you'll notice um, two things. One, God places the blame um, squarely on the role of the priest. And when you read the Old Testament, you'll know that actually in Leviticus, it's the priest's job to train the people in the word of God. And so he actually says they are not training the people, right? That's why my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? So, um, and then he goes on and says, because you've rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest over me. He's, he's laying the blame squarely on the religious leaders, right? Um, and then he goes on and he talks about how a spirit of whoredom has led people astray. And that's kind of a strange phrase, and it brings up a lot of questions uh, about sort of the spiritual realm, right? So God's people have gone astray, right? Just as Gomer went astray, his people are going astray. They're worshiping false gods. And he says the group that's leading them that way are the spiritual leaders, right? He's going to punish them because of that. But then he uses this phrase, a spirit of whoredom or a spirit of promiscuity, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this brings up this question about spiritual warfare, which um, can make people very uncomfortable. Um, and is there such a thing as a spirit of whoredom? Well, um, that's probably a question for a deeper dive. Um, to me, I think the question is, is what are we being controlled by? You know, Paul can talk and say as Christians, we keep in step with the spirit. And that we have a spirit of adoption as sons. We call God Abba, Father. You know, and I think that's the spirit that we need to be controlled by, right? Is the Holy Spirit knowing who we are in Christ rather than being wooed by the things of this world, right? And again, remember, Hosea is full of these very personal analogies, right? It's this sense that like turning away from God um, is likened to infidelity to a, to a spouse. I mean, that's how seriously God takes this. And it can make us really uncomfortable if we are unsure how to read the Bible. But I think um, we should read this as this is the heart of God who wants to love his people. And uh, just like any self-respecting spouse wants to be the only one in the eyes of their spouse, God is the same way. And he is so worthy of all of our love and adoration. 
So, I mean, I think you could keep going into chapters five and six. I dipped into chapter six quite a bit um, in my sermon. Um, I wish I could give a whole talk on covenant theology because it comes up in chapter six, verse seven. You know, what is the covenant that God made with Adam? But I'll save that for another day. Um, you know, really chapters seven through eight, you know, if I could sort of summarize these things, um, really chapter eight, seven, and nine, um, really for the rest of it, um, is, you know, if you think about it, he's talking to the northern kingdom, uh, right? Not the southern kingdom primarily. He's talking to these 10 northern tribes. And uh, it's funny because he doesn't call them by their typical name. Typically, we call that kingdom Israel and then the southern kingdom Judah. And uh, that's, that seems to be very, very common, right? But what's interesting about Hosea is he calls them Ephraim because that was the most you know, prominent, maybe the largest tribe during this time. And so he uses Ephraim as a, um, a syndectomy. Is that the word? Um, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's like where you refer to like one part to refer to the whole. So he calls them Ephraim, not that they're all Ephraimites in that one tribe, but he uses the big tribe to refer to all of them, right? And so uh, kind of like maybe I guess the way this, a Southerner calls everything a Coke. Now, Coke is the most common Coke, but not everything is a Coke. But you know what I mean when I say hand me a Coke. I don't necessarily just mean Coca-Cola, right? He can call all of Eph the nation of Israel Ephraim. Uh, but what's funny about it, uh, one of the elders pointed out that, you know, um, in a way, the story of Hosea is sort of um, Ephraim co-opted, right? They are co-opted into worshiping the Baals and they're conflicted, you know, co-opted in the sense that you are morally compromised. And uh, that's so true that um, a lot of the message of Hosea is Ephraim has been co-opted. Uh, but that's not really the message of Hosea, right? Because the goal is not just to call out the people for their sin. The goal is to point them to repentance so they can turn and be healed. And so really, um, I think the message of Hosea is an incredible message uh, for us to self-examine ourselves, to look for areas where we need to repent. And then to focus on, we serve a God who redeems. I mean, that is the heart of Hosea. Yes, Ephraim has been co-opted, but Ephraim has been redeemed. And Hosea was looking through the corridor of time saying, okay, I know God is going to gather his people. He's going to make them his people. He's going to show them mercy. I know that Messiah is coming, but how all these things fit together and what that looks like. Hosea couldn't quite see everything. And so this is when Jesus bursts into the scene in the New Testament, and he fulfills all of the promises of God. All of the Davidic uh, messianic uh, fulfillments are found in him. Uh, but even the disciples didn't see how all of the things going on in the Old Testament fit together, you know, at the cross, which is why in things like Luke 24, like in my sermon, it takes, you know, Jesus speaking to us by the Holy Spirit to show how um, all of the scriptures point to him. And in a way, now that we see that, it's almost hard to ignore. It's almost like you can't not see it. But we really need the Spirit to reveal the mystery of the ages, you know, as Paul says in Ephesians 3 to us. And so hopefully, you know, as you're reading the Old Testament, you are seeing it point to the New Testament. And you're seeing it so much more clearly now. And at the same time, I hope as you're reading the New Testament and things like Romans 9 or 1 Peter, or Matthew, when it says, out of Egypt I called my son. You're seeing the New Testament in this way that's really shedding light on the Old Testament, and you're seeing how these things are this incredibly intertwined, beautiful story. Um, and I guess just to maybe finish up if I can, um, you know, one of my favorite documents of theology is, is uh, something called the Westminster Confession. And uh, there's all kind of versions of it. Um, I'll use the old version of it now that I think about it. I like, I like old language. Um, but in chapter one of the Westminster Confession, um, this is just a summary of doctrine. Um, it's definitely not on the level of scripture, but it's a great summary of what scripture means. Um, in chapter one, it talks about why are we convinced that God's word is really God's word? And uh, listen to this answer. I love this. It says, this is Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, part 5. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. Okay, so 
One of the reasons why we believe God's word is holy because of the testimony of the church. Other Christians, other pastors, you know, they help us see that. Okay, that's good. Another reason is the heavenliness of the matter. Okay, like this is some pretty powerful heavenly stuff, you know. It's like talking about eternity and God. That's pretty cool. Then it says, another reason is the efficacy of the doctrine, like the way that the gospel humbles us, the way that it convicts, the way that it comforts, like the doctrine that it teaches, it works if you apply it, right? It really does change your life. That's a reason to believe it's scripture. Um, another one is the majesty of the style. It's written beautifully. And then I love this next one. This is what I'm getting at. It says, another reason we can be induced to believe in God's word is the consent of all of the parts. Like when you read the Bible and you realize that all of these things are so woven together uh, that God has been preaching the gospel since the time of Abraham, to, to quote from Galatians chapter 2, to see that all this is building towards Jesus, the consent of all the parts is so profound. It helps us to believe that this is God's word. But really, uh, the, what Westminster says, though, is the full persuasion and the, and the assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of the word is not in the consent of all the parts or the majesty of the style or the efficacy of the doctrine. The way that we know that this is God's word is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. And I love that uh, to finish. Um, you know, we know this is God's word because the Holy Spirit is impressing the message of God's word onto our hearts. And we get to sit back and enjoy the consent of all the parts. So hopefully you are diving into Hosea, you know, listen to the sermon if you haven't, check out the Bible Project video on Hosea, and of course, this week, read Hosea. And uh, remember, uh, right, the holiness of God, our sin, but how Christ fills in that gap, and that's growing more and more over our lifetime. I love you guys, and I will see you next week after I get back from Denver, Lord willing. See you.